Lord. In week four, we're going to talk about bowing our knees uh, in kneeling before God and what that looks like. These are all postures of worship that we bring to God. So as we prepare through this Advent season, that's what we're talking about. And this week, we want to talk to you, uh, and we believe God is going to help you uh, uh, remember how to use this posture of worship in your life in a powerful way through bringing our gifts. Somebody say, bring your gifts. Bring your gifts before God is what? Is an act of worship. That's what we're trying to get you guys to see today and remember. Today I want to talk to you about something that I think is very powerful. In fact, it starts in Matthew chapter 2. So if you look at Matthew chapter 2, it's going to be on the screen here for you. This is actually where we get the title of the series here as well. It says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, okay? And here is what they asked. Say it with me if you would. They, well, not, not quite yet. The next, the next question, okay? The next statement. They asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? And then when they saw the, his star in the east, I'm sorry, they say, we have seen his star in the east and have what? Come to worship. Come to worship. That is so awesome. The reason they came was to worship. Okay? The reason we come this season is to worship. Remember, God isn't here for us. We're here for Him, and, and we want to respond to Him. Okay? So as we, as we look further into this thing, you saw that King Herod is a part of this, right? He was actually kind of an evil king, and so in the midst of hearing this, he kind of got his panic on, right? He, he decided, I don't like what's happening. I'm suddenly afraid. My kingdom is being threatened. So what he does, what he does is he kind of lies to them. He, he's... It's, it's a half lie in order to get what he wants out of it. And he says, whenever you find out where he is, tell me so I can go and worship him as well. Disingenuous, of course. But then verse 9 says this, After they had heard the, ki the king, uh, the magi went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose, uh, it, let's see, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Okay, so the, they see the star, they follow it. Now, we read that one little verse right there, right? After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and, and the star they had seen in the east ahead of them, they, they followed that basically until it stopped over the place. That, that is like one of the most overlooked scriptures, if you, if you think about it, in, in, in the Christmas story. Think about what they did, the magnitude of what the wise men did, this journey. They traveled from Persia, or modern-day Iran, 900 miles Okay, that's how blessed they were to see that star. It's like going from Oklahoma to Phoenix. It's like going from Tampa all the way up the Panhandle all the way to Houston. Okay, it's, if you look at the, the, the width, the breadth of, of Europe, it's twice the size of Europe that they traveled. This was a long, it was painful they had made the, this journey they had made to worship the one they believed might be the Savior. In verse 10, it shows us this. When they saw the star, they, they did what? Say it aloud with me. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. 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 In fact, I want to pause on this word, and, and I want you to remember this. If you're filling in bulletin note uh, blanks and things like that on our app or in your hand here, the Magi were overjoyed to go and give. Okay, they didn't have Southwest at that time, right? They were still willing to go 900 miles. Turn me down just a little bit, Andy, if you could. 900 miles to go and to give. They were overjoyed to give. The English translation really has a hard time with the original language on this. There's actually four Greek words that go into what this overjoyed uh, translation is. It's, it actually says, rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. They rejoiced, in other words, with this humongous joy. Okay, that's what overjoyed means. It's, it's kind of like a compounding joy, if you will. It's like, we're happy about being happy that we're happy that we're happy that we're happy. That's what it means. That's, that's what they're talking about, right? It's like the song that never ends, but they're overjoyed with it. It's almost impossible to describe how full of life they were because for centuries for them, centuries, they had hoped that one day they might be, there might be a one who was born that would save them from their sins, that would rescue them. And so from the depths of their soul, they're overjoyed, happy that they're happy that they're happy with a humongous, big, gigantic joy. 
Here's the problem with some Christians today. We are underjoyed. Think about it. How did you come here today? I'm not saying you're underjoyed, by the way. I'm just asking you to think about maybe how your morning went. Are you a, we should be the most overjoyed people around. It makes no sense to me to think about the fact that a God who loved us and did something for us that we couldn't earn, didn't deserve, the fact that anybody would ever be sitting around with a sourpuss Christian look on their face, right? You guys know what look I'm talking about. I mean, you come into worship looking like you're mad, you're upset about different kinds of things, you're cri- you have a critical heart, you're angry about everything, you're nitpicking things because of it. Listen to me. If you're overjoyed today, tell your face, Okay? That's all I'm saying. Just tell your face. Tell your face that you're that happy, okay? Let it smile. Show it. Let other people around you know you're a follower of Jesus, and as such, you should be the, full of more joy than anybody else. It doesn't matter how bad life gets, right? I just heard some pretty, pretty hard things this morning. Those people still should be overjoyed at the, at, the, at the provision and the kindness and the presence of God in their lives. You've got the promise of eternity, You've got a God with you, a God who's working in all things to bring about good to those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. You have a God who is greater, who is ever-present, who is all-knowing, who is all-powerful. Don't you dare live underjoyed. You smile, you clap, you worship, you praise. Could you be fun to be around just one Christmas? That would be great. Just one Christmas. Just be the guy that's fun to be around. You Be known for what you're for and not what you're against. Christians, we got to learn to be about things that we're for, okay? Not what we're against. Be full of love. Be full of grace. When people see you, they should say, that, that's one of the happiest people I've ever met, right? People say that about Josh. They should say about me more, but they say about Josh all the time. <laughs> why? Because he's overjoyed, and here's why, okay? When he tells you a story, it's about, it's about his Savior, isn't it? Okay, when someone looks at you and if they ever said they're the happiest person, I, bet, I guarantee you, you've told them a story about Jesus. Those guys traveled 900 miles with an entourage of people and they couldn't wait to worship. So what do they do? Verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they did what? They bowed down. Okay, we're going to get to that in week four about knee, bending our knee. And then they did what? That is what they did. We're going to come back to the bowing down, but they worshiped. Now, how did they worship? I want you to watch this very carefully. Scripture tells us what they did. They worshiped Him and did it how? Look at it. Then they opened their treasures and presented Him with what? Gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were overjoyed to bow down to worship and to bring gifts to the one who would save them. They knew it. They couldn't help but respond this way. They were overjoyed to give. They did not give underjoyed, by the way. They didn't give underjoyed. They weren't complaining about how long the trip was or how stinky the camel is. (laughs) They were not upset that they had to give. Think about that this season. They were not upset they had to give. They got to give. My girls, they they, they love to give me gifts, and I I love when they do it. My birthday was just here, and even though they didn't make anything, like, personally for my birthday, my my wife gets them into the process of maybe getting me a gift or two, and and I, I play along most of the time because I love to see their faces because there's not an inch of them that goes, Mom told me to give this to you, Dad. You know, they, they don't do that. They, my, my, my youngest daughter is trying to give me secrets and hints about what I'm going to get. I mean, it's such a wonderful surprise. She, she can't wait to do it, right? It's, no longer, it's not like, man, my teacher made me b- give this to you in Sunday school class, so here you go, Dad. It's, you have a happy birthday. No, it's not like that. None of that. They, they, there was a sense of overjoyedness that they get to give, and that's what the Magi did. They gave gold, incense, and myrrh. It's been debated over centuries what these gifts actually meant or symbolized. The gold symbolizing his kingship, though, the the, the frankincense, his priestly role that he would play. And then the myrrh was this embalming uh, type of of thing. It helped prepare people for burial. 
And a lot of scholars believe that it was given to him foreshadowing that Jesus was born not just to live but to die. So here they are presenting these wonderful gifts. And sometimes when you wonder why we rehearse certain things at certain times, it's because we have to remember the thing. It's even, even his death is, is a point of worship, right? Even, even to think about how he died is something that we're going to do here this morning. It is a moment of, of worship to rehearse these things because even the, the Magi brought gifts foreshadowing the death of Jesus as they worshipped him in his infancy. See, they worshipped him and they were overjoyed to bring their gifts as an act of worship, to kneel down and with tremendous joy in their heart, they opened up the best of what they had, and they gave it to him. We, we all love the, uh, and, and, and again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you and just give you, give you the caveat right now. We, this is not another tithing message, okay? We are talking about gifts, though, okay? So we need, to, we need to hear this. We love the scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, right? It's a pretty well-known one, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. We love to claim that promise, right? But what we don't always realize is that there's other Scriptures in context and in concert with that. It says later on, do not be wise in your own eyes. It's talking about understanding, leaning not on your own understanding, because there's not enough wisdom in your mind to to understand these things. So fear the Lord and shun evil. Then verse 8, this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. So it goes on to elaborate about what this looks like. But then he says something else. So we got trust in the Lord with all your heart, right? Even when it doesn't make sense, especially when it doesn't make sense, there are certain things God asks us to to do. And he actually goes into one. He says this in verse 9, honor the Lord with your what? If If you're there with me, we're talking about it here with gifts and things like that. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And I love to say it this way, we bring our first and our best and let God bless the rest, right? That, that, that God is, you can clap for that, it's awesome, right? We, what we do is we trust God, even when it doesn't make sense, especially in our giving and our wealth, but there's all sorts of things that we bring to God, Right? Wealth is a great indicator of uh, how we give is a great indicator of where our hearts are, right? It, it, it just not only is a great one, it's probably the best one to help us understand that. But there are many things that we do, like giving our wealth, that show our trust in God and our honor of Him at the same time, right? And that's what they're saying in this. It, it, before it goes, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own, own understanding. Don't be wise in your own eyes and then honor the Lord with your wealth, recognizing that I trust you even when it doesn't make sense, and I I return to you even when it doesn't make sense, but to acknowledge that you're the provider. So we, we, it's talking about how we bring things to God. And let me, let me just tell you something. Our, our wealth, our tithe, our giving, our, our our over-the-top giving, all these things are what? They are an act of worship. We are responding to God through these things. Your trust is an act of worship. Your trust in the Lord, when things don't make sense, is an act of worship and a response to His great love. There are a lot of things that God seemingly does that don't make sense, right? We trust Him with that, and then we honor Him, and these things are, are worshipful. Today, I, wanna, I want you, maybe like never before, to, to give to God as an act of worship. To bring your gifts, and, and some of you are like, well, like, I already told you that we're not, it's not a tithing message, but you're like, oh, he's going back to tithing again. He, I know it's going to happen anyway. He said no, but, and I brought a friend, and I brought him on this week. Oh, my goodness. Some of you are like, oh, no. If he, if he mentions money again, we just had that three weeks. Just rapture come now, right? I don't want to do this. But what I actually want to do, instead of focusing on the how, is I want you over the next 20 minutes to hear the Spirit of God speak to you. And just, and just help you know that you can look forward to, you can think about, you can plan, you can strategize being overjoyed to give to God who gave everything to you. So why should it be this way? Why be overjoyed to bring our gifts, okay? Whatever they look like. And we're going to talk about our ultimate gift. Why be overjoyed? First of all, because love gives, right? 
I mean, we're about, to, we're about to get into communion, but this is it. Doesn't it, when, some, when you love someone, don't you give to them? Holly and I uh, have, have toyed with this a little bit, but this year we're doing it again. Uh, we're really not giving each other gifts this, this Christmas. We have everything we really feel like we need, right? So we decided together at this point, after 15 years, we're not going to give each other gifts. But here's the thing. I, I'm crazy about her. And, and I have this thing where I, I'm still in quest of like the perfect gift. And so because of those two things married together in my life right now, I'm probably going to break the rule. I, just, I know she's hearing this. She's at home with one of our sick kids. But I know, I know that we said we weren't going to give anything, but I just can't help it. I just, I just have to. And she's going to say, you broke the rule. And I'm going to say, it's okay. Love gives, so just accept the gift, right? That's what, that's what happens. It's not like when Valentine's was coming when you were younger and you broke up with your girlfriend on February 12th and then suddenly got back together with her on February 15th. I know none of you did that. Because none of you are cheap, right? You didn't like to, you, you love to give in those moments. Anyway, if you didn't do that, you should have because you didn't marry that person anyway. So why, <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm sorry. That was, but love gives, love gives. Love actually loves to give. Loves it. It's overjoyed to give. Anybody know this verse, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave, right? That's how much he loved us. He loves to give, and love gives because God looked at creation and realized that they were separated by sin, and the only way that they could, make, they could be made right with him is if someone innocent would die in their place, someone without sin. So he became flesh among us, and in the person of Jesus lived a perfect life, died, rose again, and so that anyone who puts their faith in him would be saved. That is the message of the gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave. Love gives. That's what God does. 1 John 4.10 says a very similar thing. We love, why? Because God first loved us. Because love gives. When you love, you can see it in the lives of people because love gives. In fact, Romans 5.8 says this, but God does what? Everybody say it aloud. God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's a demonstration of His love that He would send His Son to die on the cross. He was so, he was so overjoyed to do it because He's so filled with love. Because God is love. God didn't, folks, shout his love from heaven. He showed us his love on earth, didn't he? He didn't have to shout it from a, from a place separated from us. He came to us and he showed us how much he loves us and he gave of his son. And so today, as we think about that gift, we're going to move into a time of communion and take communion together, understanding why I think the Magi came to this baby following a star 900 miles because they knew this person could change the game. This person can change things for us. We can't change anything, but this person, this is the one that's been promised. So Pastor Todd, would you come and lead us today in our communion time? Love gives. Amen? God demonstrated His own love for us in this while we were Still sinners, Christ died for us. Because of what Christ did for me, folks, I don't know about you, I think it's the same. I, I am overjoyed to be a tither. I'm overjoyed about that. I'm overjoyed to give offerings above and beyond. I can't wait to see the, the notification in my email that my dollar club gift went out, that, 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 that I, I find that person, the Holy Spirit lets me know through someone or just in my own spirit, there's someone that needs help, I, I want you to give to them, I can't wait to do that, I'm overjoyed to give monthly to, to missionaries all across the world that are friends of mine, I'm overjoyed to give back to God with everything in me, to, to do this because why, I'm hoping... It, First and foremost, it's because He gave to me, right? But I'm hoping that it leads as an example to just irrational generosity around us all. That we'd all be overjoyed to do what we get to do in order, to be, in order for it to be an act of worship and response to Him. We truly believe around here, it's more blessed to give than to receive. Amen? Amen. I cannot wait to see how many gifts come off that tree. Not because I just said it, but because you guys can't wait as well 
to grab something and to bless a life who needs something. And it needs a measure of hope. It needs, needs a sense of love that people care about them. I can't wait. I am overjoyed to see that tree empty. Why? Because God first gave to us. We're overjoyed to, be, to give because love loves to give. I've never once said, I, I don't want to tithe. I wish I could. No, I don't do that. I love to return to God because God blessed me. I love to give beyond that because God is so good. Love loves to give. But it's more than just giving wealth, right? It's, that's very important. And again, I'll say it again. What you do with your money is an indicator of what's in your heart, period. There's no argument whatsoever about that. We honor God with our wealth, it says. We honor Him. We worship Him. It's like an act of love back. But the ultimate thing that we give is way beyond that. We're to give our lives. Why do we bring our gifts to Christ? Why be overjoyed to bring our gifts? Because it is in response to His ultimate gift of His life. Is there an amen out there for that? It is in response to God's ultimate gift to us that we ultimately give our own lives, that we bring our gifts, and the ultimate one we bring is ourselves. This is what Paul said, and, and don't forget who Paul was. Some of you, maybe, maybe you don't like Christians right now. Maybe you hate them. I don't know. Maybe you're not a believer yet, and they've just done you wrong for a long time. You'd like Paul because he hated Christians, by the way. He hated them more than you did. He killed them. That's how much he hated them. Not a joke. I'm not trying to be silly here. He was transformed, though, right? The guy who was imprison, imprisoning, beating, and torturing, and killing Christians was so transformed by God, this is what he wrote. He said, therefore... I urge you, brothers and sisters, say this next part with me, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, holy and pleasing to God. Keep saying it. This is what? Your true and proper worship. The Magi were overjoyed at a Savior who gave it all. God loved first. He demonstrated this for us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died. So they traveled far. They traveled hard to open up their treasures to kneel before Him, to worship Him. We love because He first loved us. This scene of the Magi reminds me of a current scene in reality going on right now in heaven around the throne of God. It's a scene that John got in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4, it, it, it describes this scene of, of many different things going on, and there are four living creatures, and they're, they're said to be kind of hovering around or over the throne of God. So the throne of God is, as I read it, is kind of in the middle. These angels, these living creatures are there. They have wings covering their body and, and, and uh, appear in their torso, and then another set of wings that they fly with, and they're there, and it says the only thing they're there to do is to bring glory and honor and thanks to God. And they say the same thing over and over again, right? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they, and they sing this, right? Who was and is and is to come, and they sing this out, and there's glory and there's honor going on all the time with these living creatures. But I love this next part because what you, he, what you see then are, 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 and it says that these 24 elders, I don't know if they're just like the cream of the crop, right? I, they just, they're there though, surrounding the throne. And guess what happens? Once you, whenever the living creatures give honor, or give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders do what? They fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. See, when we get in the presence of Jesus, you truly experience the glory of God. That's what the living creatures are doing perpetually. They're, they're bringing glory and honor to the one who lives forever and ever, right? And, and every time they do it, what happens? Every single time, it never gets old, what happens? These elders, they, they drop to their knees. They fall from their thrones, given to them by God. This glory of their own that they have, they fall from their thrones, and then this happens. Look at the next scripture with me. They lay their crowns before the throne. I want you to catch this. 
Think about the Magi as they've, as they've walked, traveled 900 miles, and they get into the presence of a, of a two-year-old. Okay? And what do they do? They get down on their knees, and they give him their treasures. Folks, this is happening right now in heaven. Every time these living creatures give honor and glory and thanks to the one who lives forever and ever, these, these 24 elders tell us what this, the next part is going to be. It is what? It's a response to God's ultimate gift. And it's a response not only to His mercy, but to His glory. And it says, they say, You are worthy, our Lord God, to receive glory and honor and power, for You created all things, and by Your will they were created and have their being. The recognition of God's glory and His greatness is a natural response for us. The natural response is to fall to our knees and to worship. This is something that is natural when it comes. That The surrounding of God's throne with these other people who have glory themselves. I mean, can you imagine if you were in one of these elders? You have a throne in heaven. You have a crown on your head. But man, when you're in the presence of the Almighty, nothing of glory that is yours, it all pales in comparison to the glory of God. Okay? I had a friend who said recently, and it stuck with me deeply, when, when we tend to hold on to things because of its value and its worth to us, it was in context of, of how the church has been kind of asleep and COVID's kind of woken us up to new things and God's doing a new thing. Would you agree with that? God's doing a wonderful thing. But he said sometimes we, we hold on to things because they were, they were good. They were, maybe it wasn't even broken. It was, it's a good thing and we want to hold on to it because we don't really know what the future may hold, even if God wants to give us something else. And he said what happens is we, we hold on to the crowns or the thrones that we have in our lives because because they're good, but he says this is exactly why you need to get into the presence of God so you can see His glory. Here's why. In order to lay down our treasures and our crowns, in order for us to exit our thrones and bow down, we have to experience a glory bigger than the one we're holding. Bigger than the one you're holding. Because once you see a glory that is larger than the one that you have had in the past, you, 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 don't, you, you don't have any worries anymore. It's just whatever this is, it pales in comparison. It's all yours. You're, you receive all the glory. You are worthy. You are worthy. Right? That's the scene that we're seeing in both of these places, in heaven and with the Magi. They got into the presence of glory, and they fell to their feet. They bowed low, and they offered their treasures. Because nothing compares to the glory of God. And when the elders and the Magi were in the presence of Jesus, His glory caused them to lay down their treasures. Your ultimate gift is in response to God's ultimate gift. Your surrender is in view of God's mercy. Your gift-giving is in response to the glory of God and His greatness. We are overjoyed and willing to give up anything and lay it down before Jesus. Why? Because His glory and mercy is greater than anything this world has to offer. His mercy is overflowing and compelling. Paul said it this way in Philippians 3.8, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of what the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. When you get into the presence of greatness and glory, your natural response is to worship, and you do it by, by laying it all down, including your life. It's not just your wealth. It's your whole being. It's everything that you have. Nothing is worthy compared to Him. And so we lay it all down before Him. Folks, today... If you're hesitant or reluctant to, to surrender, to, to show your, your love for God because He first loved you, if this is, there's a reluctance in you. Simply giving your life as a sacrifice, holy and pleasing. Let me encourage you. 
to remember that Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. He said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't be wise in your own eyes. In all, the, in all of your ways, in all of your life, in all the things about who you are, trust Him. Show Him that. And then later on, He says, honor Him with what you have. It's not just, it's not just your money. It's your whole being. Honor Him with what you have. And he says, the rest he takes care of, doesn't he? Because that's not the purpose anymore. See, when you get in the presence of glory, the, the, the point is not what you're giving up, it's who you're in the presence of, isn't it? And there's nothing more valuable than him. There's nothing more valuable than, than the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ Jesus your Lord. There's nothing more valuable. Worship God with what you have. This is the only, the only one of the ways that we worship God is through our wealth, but it's a very important way to do that. But they were overjoyed, and they opened up their treasures, and they worshiped Him. But I guarantee you that wasn't, that was just a, 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 a meager offering in that moment to them. Trust in the Lord. Trust Him. And the worship team is going to come back up, and we're going to adore Christ today together. You'll have an opportunity, as we always do every week before we leave, to, to, to return your tithes and to give your offerings and to go into the lobby and to, and to grab an angel tree gift and, and to go and, and, and to gift that for somebody else and just love on them in this way. But I'm just I'm asking you today, as we remember what Christ did for us, worship Him with what you have. Give Him in response to His ultimate gift what you have. Trust Him. Honor Him. Honor Him with the first fruits of your wealth. See Him and make Him first in all things, in other words. I hope that you see Him today. I hope that you see the greatness and the glory of God. And your response is just to, to bow low and to give Him everything you have. Some, some of you, that's, I'm going to begin to give again. I, I, we, we've heard it all for the last three weeks, and yes, now, now I know I, this is a response of worship. I need to do this. Some of you, you, right now, you're going through tough things, and you want to lean on your own understanding, and it's not there, and you need to trust Him. That's your gift right now to Him, to trust Him, and to not be wise in your own eyes, but to let Him lead and guide you through life right now. Bring that to Him today. Adore Him with that today. But folks, we're going to get into his presence. And whatever your gift looks like, bow low and lay it at his feet. He is worthy. Amen? He is worthy of all the honor and glory and worship we could give him. So stand to your feet today. No matter what you do today, when you give, be overjoyed to worship in his presence because he's worthy to be adored with all things in our lives. Would you do that with us today? You step down from Thank you.
me sing. Let me hear it again. I lost. <laughs> oh God. There we go. Thank you. Just lift your voices. want you to keep standing here. Bow your heads and worship in prayer with me today. God has a sense of humor. The guy who led worship couldn't find a key, and the guy who never sings <laughs> found it for me. That's, what, that's how good God is. Thank you, Josh. This joy. They rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It was a humongous, big, compounding joy. Are you happy that you're happy that you're happy that Jesus died for you? Whether or not we acknowledge Him with that kind of joy, He is still worthy. He is still high and lifted up. He is still seated on the throne. So God, we come before you today recognizing your plan to demonstrate your love for us. And in view of that mercy, we give. We give. We give not begrudgingly. We don't give out of aught. We give because you first gave to us. So today, would you receive our heartfelt worship? as a response. May it be an aroma that is pleasing to you. Some may hear it and see it and experience it, and it is like the smell of death. But to this room, it's like the aroma of Christ. Would you receive our worship? Thank you that you've given us the ability to love when we first couldn't love the way we could, we can now. Thank you, God, that you gave us that ability. You, you have shown us what it looks like to love sacrificially. Thank you, Lord, for how you've shown us. But more importantly, thank you that because of your ultimate act, our hearts can fulfill their calling, and that is to love the world around us and declare the glory of God and the good news of the gospel. We owe you all, and we give to you all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we're going to continue in worship today by the returning of our offerings and the, and the give, or the returning of our tithe, the giving of our offerings. You can join our Push Pay family online, like we talked about, by texting that keyword to that to that number. But let's ask God to bless what we bring into Him and multiply it the only the way He can. Father in heaven, what you give to us, we you've only asked for a little bit back, so we return that to you today, and we give you. Our, our offerings as well. And we ask, God, that you would take them and do with them what only you can do. Multiply them for your kingdom and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.